Okay, I got a string of photos on the side. Let me uh, reduce those. Okay, if you're ready, I guess I'm ready. Looks good. Um, what we're going to talk about is trying to make some sense out of the casual and accidental species that show up in Duchess. Uh, these have always fascinated me. There's quite a collection of, of, of birds you just never would expect to find. And uh, when I did the reference guide for the last update, uh, I did some extra work on this and Barbara, call, Barbara Michelin called me a month or so ago and said, do you have something to make a program out of? And here we are. So I'm going to go through some definitions, which is the big deal and numbers. And then we'll talk about a few of the birds and how they fit in and what I call transitions. And, and at that point, I'm done and I'll take question and answers at the end. The, um, the definitions that have traditionally been used for years and years is that accidental is something has been seen very few times, once or twice. And casual, sometimes called rare, the, the words accidental and casual are not uh, universally used. Uh, accidental might be called a vagrant, uh, casual might be called rare. Uh, the words are, are vary from uh, author to author and book to book, but Inevitably, it has to do with how many times a bird was seen in a state, in a county. Um, even look at your National Geographic field guide, and if you look in those first few pages of introduction, you can find that they tell you what criteria was used to list a bird in the field guide, and again, it's numbers. However, the new definition, which is slowly being uh, uh, accepted more often, I, I, there's no big movement on this, but you can find this now, is that accidental is defined as something that a bird that is not expected and far out of his range. Now the far out of range is, is less relevant, it's that not expected. And casual is expected, again, it wasn't expected to begin with necessarily, but it's close by, the range is probably not as far. And we'll get into a little more definitions on that. I just threw some pictures up here. I have more pictures later, but I start off with a lot of words and uh, Joan doesn't like too many words. So I threw this in. Um, if some of those birds, I'm sure some of you have seen and most of you probably haven't seen a lot of them. Uh, may not even be sure what some of them are. I, I, I defy how many people can name that gull in the middle, but uh, the one at the bottom you can name, the spoonbill. I bet all of you saw that spoonbill last year. Um, and uh, the hoary red pole, that was last year. The sandaling, that picture just got taken. Um, we haven't had too many sandalings in Dutchess County, but uh, they do occasionally come through and that's the first picture. And of course the avocet and the pelican, you get the idea. Um, so looking at some numbers, Griscom is the uh, Ludlow Griscom that, uh, took Munzel Crosby's data in 1933 and published it. He had 209 regularly seen birds and he himself listed 36 of them as casual accidental. Um, 36 is 17% of, of uh, 245 adding the two together. And if we go down and look at uh, Eleanor Pink and Oak Waterman's book in 64 and what Barbara and, and I did in 2006, it seems like yesterday, but that, uh, that's 15 years already. So looking at the bottom line, we now have, we've gone from 1933, 209 regular birds to 253. Um, regular means that they are seen and expected, um, not necessarily every year, but regularly. The casual accidental, which we will focus on, you can see has grown significantly. And as a percentage, it's grown. Uh, on an average, uh, over a decade, we add four regular birds every decade. And the casual accidental has been increasing by nine. So that's almost one a year. But it really is a little more than that because uh, as I say on the bottom, the casual accidental is the incubator for regular species. A casual bird that has been seen, in our case, we, we generally look at 10 times, but that's not cast in concrete. Um, if it's seen 10 times, we consider that regular, 10 times in over a 50 year period. Um, 
So a lot of those casual accidental have migrated into the regular column. And so there have been extra casual accidental in order to increase as much as it had, has. Um, and I want to compliment the whole club and, and everyone in Dutchess County on how good our data is. This is something that Mary Key really harped on regularly that uh, of the 71 casual accidental species, uh, 11 of those are backed up with specimens. Uh, generally, those were taken from the 30s and earlier, but still we have specimens of some exotic birds. Uh, photos are the new thing, uh, as you well know. 37 photos, that's, uh, that's half of them, uh, and that is fabulous. The um, more than three people, if one person or two people or actually three people see a bird, uh, we will consider that hypothetical. Uh, it takes that fourth person that's, that's knowledgeable to uh, be a mob of people that can then vouch for the bird being correctly identified. And of our 71, 17 of them fit that category. Uh, where that wasn't the case, where only one or two people saw it, uh, some of that has been submitted to NISOC and three of those were, uh, were accepted and hence we accept it. And there are three old ones that were grandfathered. Um, the three old ones are ruddy turnstone, red knot, and the black-legged kittiwake, uh, not birds we see all the time. And this little, uh, that uh, bar graph, if you will, dot graph, I sometimes call it in the middle. This comes out of the new version of the reference guide. Um, because of the pandemic, I don't know how well that's been distributed, but last fall, uh, we published a new version of the reference guide. It's called the 1921, uh, the uh, 2021 edition. And uh, it has all the casual accidentals expanded in this format to show you which months they are regularly seen. The uh, color, if you will, of the dot, a, a hollow dot or a white dot says it was seen just one day. A gray dot says it was seen uh, multiple days, but less than a week. A black dot was seen at least a week or more. And where there's a line showing up, that is a month or more. And uh, if you stare at this and more specifically at the, uh, the reference guide and you look at all of them, you will notice that when they show up is migration, which is probably exactly when you would expect an odd bird to show up. It's sometimes spring and it's sometimes fall, but it's regularly in migration. And also you notice the lines are all in winter. Uh, once a, an odd bird shows up and is happy uh, and stays, and stays an extended period of time, like the summer tanager last year, uh, that is invariably over the winter. And I think this is close to the last one of, of all these numbers. Uh, this is simply taking the most recent sighting of those 71 species. And... Um, before 1970, there was only one casual species still hang hanging on. And that's because it's expected again, and they do show up again. Yet there are seven accidentals that are older than 1970. And I think that's kind of what you would expect too, because they're not expected. So at least in my eyes, we're making some sense out of this. The, the ones that are not expected just age, and the ones that are expected repeat. And when we get down to the New Year's, that last line that really only covers 2020 and 2021. And in those two years, we've already got five uh, casual that, that uh, have been cited again, not necessarily new ones. They may be old ones that were recited, but that's the most recent. Uh, and the same with the three, uh, three accidentals. So what I'm now going to go into is, and this is where I'll bring some pictures back into it, um, is why these birds are expected again, or why they show up, but are not expected, yet they did indeed show up. So we have 32 casual species. Um, by the way, that uh, when I call a bird casual or accidental, I try to have a rhyme and reason for it. And when it's not too clear, I usually will pass it by Barbara. And if it's not clear, I'll also pass it by Karina. Um, and so hopefully, 
we're not too far off here. There's some agreement or it was obvious. Nevertheless, if people think some of these are uh, uh, miscategorized, I would uh, love to debate it at some time or share an email. In any case, the birds that are expected again are either breeding nearby or they winter someplace probably north of us and occasionally erupt further south or they're migrating through. Migrating is always a little rough because they don't always stop here. We may not have the right habitat such as with shorebirds, but uh, they're still migrating through the Hudson Valley or somewhere in the Northeast as opposed to the Mississippi Valley or, or far West. The accidentals on the other hand, there are a number of birds that wander and that work is starting to be uh, expanded upon and I'll go into some of that that others are doing to uh, identify who wanders and how they wander. And then of course storms. Now we're lucky in that we're near the ocean and not that close, you're not gonna go uh, put your toes in it today, but uh, when, a, when a hurricane comes up or when a big ocean storm comes by and throws birds inland as has happened numerous times, that's a reason for an unexpected bird to show up. And then what I called everything else, and everything else is kind of a hodgepodge that I have not been able to uh, accurately, at least in my eyes, accurately record reasons that they're here. It's just everything else. Um, there are three odd birds, odd in the sense of they're extinct or uh, extirpated. Um, the passenger pigeon we throw into this category of uh, casual accidental because it's uh, clearly not expected again. And the extirpated are the Henslow sparrow and the loggerhead shrike. Um, you got that northern shrike showing up. It's been a long time since a, uh, a loggerhead shrike did. The photos I'm about to show uh, are all from Dutchess County and I try to credit the, the photographer. And in each case, the, uh, the birds of Dutchess County book that Barbara and I did will give you uh, a total chapter and verse detail on the day it was seen and who saw it and how many times and so forth. So we're going to go into uh, birds that are in the region for breeding. And uh, some of these are spring overshoots. They, they breed south of us. Uh, and some of them are after breeding, they just disper disperse. There are four that fit this category. Um, and blue grosbeak. Now this is one from this year already. And uh, Debbie got a good photo here. Uh, it first bred on Long Island in 1982. It's, it's a Southern bird that just like uh, a lot of the, whether it be the mockingbird or the titmouse in times past or the red bellied woodpecker or uh, whatever. Um, it, it's expanding north and uh, it's with this sighting, this was the 10th sighting in the last 30 years as it turns out. And um, that's an example. Uh, the summer tanager, same thing from last year. That started breeding on Long Island in 1990. And um, we don't ha yet have, have 10 of them, so it's not regular, it is casual. Um, but they have been seen multiple times. Barbara Butler saw one I recall uh, in the records. I think it was Barbara and one other person had it. But multiple people sometimes get to see these. A tricolored heron, this one's not too common. Um, well, this one was seen in 2019. It first bred on Long Island in 1955 and it's pretty well stayed there. Nevertheless, herons are remarkable for their post-breeding dispersals and uh, that happens. So it's uh, not totally unexpected. Now the wintering ones, um, I list three at the bottom of the chart here. The black-backed woodpecker. Um, I never saw one of these in Dutchess, and I think the last one was, in fact, I even wrote that down. Um, no, I guess I didn't write it down here. I think it was 1975, though. We had, we had multiple black-backed woodpeckers showing up in Dutchess County. Boreal chickadee has not been around for a long time, and I remember when they were, quote-unquote, everywhere. And uh, Bohemian Waxwings is another one that's been very slowly in expanding south. It has expanded east quite well, but not south very well. Um, here's a Jeer Falcon. Uh, when was the last time you saw a Jeer Falcon in Dutchess County? Here's a picture of it, but it was 1987. 
And that's another one, it's, it's further north that they do erupt occasionally and you can get lucky. So it is what I call expected. Uh, Canada J, I remember this one very well. This was over at the uh, uh, Sky Acres Airport, 1975. He stayed around for a few months. He was eating some suet across the street at a house feeder. Uh, it looks like a great big chickadee. Uh, and they're just, they're not coming down anymore. Nevertheless, they are eruptive to a degree. They are north of us. And so we put it in the, could be expected again in the casual category. Um, here's one from just last year. Um, we have not had a lot of hoary red poles. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about merging these with the uh, common red pole. But every, uh, every July when the new, uh, changes of sequences and names comes out, this guy has still held his own. So uh, we call him casual and every now and then they do show up in a red pole year. Uh, the last one I have as a category for casual is the migration route, what I call variances. Uh, mostly these are shorebirds and seabirds that are migrating from the St. Lawrence River or further north uh, to the Atlantic uh, or further south and they simply come down the, uh, the Hudson River Valley. Uh, Black-legged kittiwakes, would you believe? They've been seen four times in Dutchess County. Uh, and the red fowler rope as well, four times has been seen. So again, they're somewhat expected because their migration is near Dutchess County. So that's trying to make a little sense of the, of the casual birds. Uh, oops, well, uh, barnacle geese is, was there one at Round Pond? Someone have been a barnacle goose lately, I think. In any case, they breed in Greenland and uh, generally, and further in Iceland and, and uh, possibly the Northern Europe, uh, but normally they migrate down to Africa and, and, and Southern Europe, but they've started with some of the Canada geese to come West and West is North America and they go down the Atlantic coast and they do show up, um, if you will, somewhat regularly. So I'm still in the casual pictures. Hudsonian Godwit, here's a nice picture that Karina took. Um, that map I put there, the uh, center of the county, uh, the center of the country is the way they migrate in the spring. And in the fall, they go east to the coast and out over the Atlantic. Um, we just had one on one of our walks last week. That was the highlight of our, uh, of our walk. We had one of these here in uh, Maine. And Nelson Sparrow, now again, uh, nice picture from uh, Debbie and a couple of years ago there, 10 years ago. Uh, and they were just seen uh, this whole, this fall up at uh, Greg Farm in Red Hook. So they do show up periodically. They migrate through, they're not here to breed. They certainly don't winter here, they'll keep going. And now I'm getting into some accidentals. Um, this VI3 and there's one VI2 in there. Ignore that for the minute and I'll explain that in the next foil. But uh, note that there are a lot of threes there for that. These are the birds that wander. And uh, often they can wander across the whole continent. Um, Fulvus whistling duck, we've only got one, uh, one sighting of that, but uh, Normally they're down in uh, Mexico, Southern Texas, maybe Florida, uh, but we had one in Dutchess. White-tailed kite is not a common bird and it doesn't wander all that much. I'll talk about that too in a minute. Mountain bluebird amazes me that we have had two mountain bluebirds in Dutchess County. Uh, painted bunting showed up here, they do move around. And this one here, this yellow-headed blackbird, um, six times. And we have yet to get a picture of that. So, but it hasn't been around lately. So I'm hoping we'll come back again and somebody might get a picture of it, but it's still accidental. Now I wanna explain that VI number. Um, Pete Dunn, Pete Dunn is the fellow down at uh, uh, Cape May. And he defines what is called a vagrancy index. So hence the VI. And if it's a VI of zero, that is a bird that basically either stays put or migrates between two places or out west. Oftentimes you have migration that's, that's uh, 
up and down a mountain. In the, in the summer, they're at the top of the mountain, and in the uh, uh, winter, they're at the bottom of the mountain, but there's no vagrancy. One, there's a slight tendency in a, in a small area, but, but nothing major. The two, uh, a little bit more, a modest pattern of, of uh, vagrancy, but all in all, you're not likely to see it. And that you noticed was, uh, that's where the two showed up on the white-tailed kite there. And then the threes. The threes are it, the bird that has a real established pattern of vagrancy. And it's quite likely that it will be seen somewhere long away, far away from its, uh, its home territory. Uh, the example I like to use, and we don't have a good one yet in Dutchess County, is the uh, scissor tail flycatcher. The scissor tail flycatcher normally nests in Oklahoma and parts of Texas, maybe a little bit into uh, Kansas, but uh, it's pretty well set in a spot in the middle of the country. Yet the uh, uh, scissor tail flycatcher has been recorded in every single state of uh, North America. Of uh, I believe in Alaska, I'm not sure about Hawaii, it has not there, but uh, it moves around. And that last number four, um, those are birds. I, don't, I didn't look up the scissor tail flycatcher. He may be a four, but it, it goes around. So Rufus Hummingbird um, showed up in Dutchess County. There's a picture of it. That map, uh, this is in, um, I stole that out of uh, Sibley's big book, the uh, first edition. Um, the, what I like about the first edition is all those green dots in the east. He dropped that for some reason in his second edition, but the green dots, dots represent where that bird has been reported outside of its normal area. So you can see why it's earned a vagrancy index of three likely to be, be found someplace outside of its area. Uh, and you notice too, which is quite typical, not just of this, this particular bird, but when they get to the coast, they stop and they may wander up and down the coast they may stay for a while, but the coast is where things do show up. It's kind of a dead end, if uh, you can think of it that way. And here's our friend from, uh, from last year, and uh, Karina's nice picture. Uh, and if you look now, this is another one of those pictures I got from uh, Sibley. Uh, he's only got a vagrancy index of two. It's not at all as widespread as what we just saw with the hummingbird, although it does have that tendency to show up along the coast. But there's a fair number of dots in the middle, but uh, not as dense as we saw before. So these are accidental wanderers. Um, white pelican. We have a number of reports and photographs of white pelicans in Dutchess County. Um, they may be expanding. This one may turn up casual at some time. They do nest now in Ontario, which they hadn't done for some time. Uh, so. Uh, birds can stand that start out being accidental and what they call pioneers. Uh, I haven't studied this part, but I've had other people talk to me about it, where they think some birds are just not satisfied where they are living and they send out looking for new areas to expand to and how they communicate that and how they expand the flock. I'm not sure, but, uh, some birds clearly uh, do expand their range and they started out accidental and maybe there was a pioneer that uh, brought word back of some good territory in Dutchess County, we'll see. Um, the storms, and now these are a couple examples down there that amaze me. A long-tailed Jaeger, 1929, it was hit by a car, I believe it was in Pleasant Valley, the book will tell you, um, and the skin was saved and given to Alan Frost at the uh, Vassar Brothers Institute. And the dove key there, twice, there are four skins, two of them from 1901 and two of them from 1932, in what they call a wreck. Uh, 1932 was a big wreck. Um, a storm hit the, uh, off of New England, off the Atlantic, right in the middle of a massive migration of dove keys. 
and they were all blown inland all over New England, hundreds of them, maybe multiple, multiple hundreds. And uh, there's a paper that was written on this in the uh, 1933, 34 time frame, pulling together those records. And two of them showed up in, uh, in Dutchess County and uh, they don't do too well afterwards and, and they died and, and the skins were saved. Uh, the 1901 ones were shot by uh, uh, Arthur Bloomfield in uh, Hyde Park. But again, those are ocean storms that uh, brought them to us. And here's one which I'll bet uh, basically none of you have seen. Um, Sooty Turn in just last year, uh, it's a second record of a Sooty Turn. There were eight of them seen along the Hudson River uh, back in 1960 something or another. But this one was last year and there was a hurricane that came through and uh, he was picked up in a lady's backyard over in Clinton, I believe. And uh, it was injured and she took a picture of it and took it over to, uh, I wouldn't say Sharon, it was a, it was a rehabilitator a veterinarian and it died. And I tried to find out what happened to the skin and I never did learn that. So I don't know if the skin was saved or not. Uh, for some reason, I think it wasn't, but I really don't know. In any case, uh, this is an example, recent times of a sooty turn, great picture there. The lady that found it thought it was a, a, a woodpecker. And you can see why they uh, might've thought that. Uh, and this is another one of those amazing ones. Uh, Susan's husband took this. He happened to be out in the boat on the Hudson and he saw this odd bird and uh, turned out to be a Manx shearwater. And the last one is what I called, no idea why, I call them errant migrants. And uh, Ross's goose, uh, Ross's goose migrate generally through the center of the country. And uh, there are not many inland records uh, the Puffin, there's an odd one, and he's not, not much of a migrant. We have no idea where he came from. I always suspected this guy really came on a, on a ship that came up the Hudson until a few years ago. Another one was found up near Lake George and uh, absolutely the same circumstances as the, the one in Dutchess County. It was emaciated, it died, it was found or it was caught before it died, um, but there was no ocean going ship on Lake George. Um, weed ears are, uh, are pretty good migrants, but uh, they're in the Northern Canada, but they migrate to Greenland, Iceland and go over uh, to Europe, not normally through the United States. The brambling, that's a European bird. Um, one was found in Dutchess County and I'll uh, have pictures of it. Uh, it doesn't get a vagrancy index by Pete Dunn because it's European. Um, chestnut collared long spur, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a vagrant that's expected, but not much in the east. If you looked at those uh, green dots in Sibley, um, there aren't many in the east. And Ta Ta Townsend's Wobbler, another one that has shown up in Dutchess County. So here's a picture Jim Key took of a bird that was northern gannet, immature. Uh, you can see they're not too vagrant, vagrancy index of one. Uh, it was the second record, believe it or not. Um, it was captured, I believe it was at the uh, uh, South Road Cemetery uh, in Poughkeepsie and it wasn't doing too well. And it was taken across the river to uh, New Paltz uh, to the uh, DEC uh, office there, uh, put in this cage and uh, I'd have to look in the book now. I don't remember quite what happened to it. But anyway, it was in Dutchess County. Tough to duck. Kurt McDermott got a picture of this. I, I, I think uh, um, Chet Vincent found it though. I, I may have misremembered this. It's a European bird again. Um, so, uh, but it showed up here. So getting towards the end here, I want to talk about transitions. What I mean by transitions is the, the accidentals don't always stay accidental, just as the casuals don't stay casual. 
So the accidental may become casual and casual becomes accidental. The, the rule that Barbara and I use is if you can see it 10 times in 50 years, then that's regular. Uh, the average, by the way, is 30 years. Uh, when I was, was working on this a couple of years ago, I actually put this stuff in a spreadsheet and did some calculations. And the average new regular bird is 30 years from its first sighting to its 10th sighting. Now, I keep talking about 10. The 10 is not that unique. It's just a nice round number. Uh, sometimes if a bird is seen three years in a row, uh, we'll give that uh, regular status. I think that's happened once. Uh, if we have multiple birds being seen in multiple locations at the same time, that's also an indication that it's now becoming regular. And if you go through the lists, I, if those of you that have the, uh, the last time we print, oh, download, download the uh, Birds of Dutchess County off the website. Um, in an appendix in the back of all the birds that have become regular since 1910, I attempt to list the first 10 sightings. And it's quite interesting to, to stare at that and see uh, how you saw it once and it went 10 years, you saw it a second time and it went five years, you saw it a third time and it went two years. It's amazing how regular some of these changes are where it transitions uh, in becoming regular. But there are transitions in reverse direction too. A regular bird can just not be seen. And the, the rule of thumb, and there's nothing magic about this, if it goes 25 years without being seen, um, I demote it and it's no longer kept as a regular bird. It goes to be listed on the casual. Um, and that's happened a few times and those are listed in the back of the book also with the last 10 sightings that then went 25 years and, and, and nothing. Um, but having said this, that birds transition, there are indeed, we saw in one of those tables I showed at the beginning, there's one casual accidental bird that was seen before 1970 and hasn't been seen since. Um, so some of them do remain for quote unquote forever. I got a couple more pictures here with a little history behind them. Sandhill cranes. Now, if you had told me that you were going to see a sandhill crane in Dutchess County 30 or so years ago, I'd said you're crazy. Uh, Sandhill cranes were just simply not seen in the Northeast. In fact, they were seldom seen around the mid-Atlantic states. Uh, yet, if you go back into the literature, they were reported in the 1700s in colonial times uh, in the Northeast. And there's a big arguments, were they herons or were they cranes and how were their feet and, he and head and da, 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 da. Did the people know them, know what they were talking about? But it's believed that they were in fact in the Northeast in the 1700s. Um, there was one accepted record in New York State, not Dutchess County, in 1948. And then in the 60s, there were a number of records. The first one in Dutchess County was Tivoli Bay in 1983. Um, the first nesting took place in New York State in 2003 at Montezuma. And believe it or not, the, from 1983 to uh, 1914, it had shown up 10 times in like this picture. Um, and now it, it shows up almost every year that somebody will hear it fly overhead or see it or it's nest in a cornfield, not nest, but rests in a cornfield. Um, an old picture of a, of a tame boreal chickadee. It, it's not tame because it was captured. It was simply, uh, it was hungry. And uh, it, it came to food being fed by Manzel Crosby here. Um, but it's interesting through the records. Before 1913, there were very few eruptions in southern New York. They, they did not erupt this far south. They were definitely boreal birds. Uh, nevertheless, we had one in uh, 1912 in Dutchess County. Uh, and then there were a number of invasions through the 30s and 40s and 50s and whatever. In 19, the winter of 61, 62, there were at least 11 boreal chickadees in Dutchess County at the same time. Um, that ended up with the other invasions. We made it regular. Uh, in, in 75, 76, there were at least 13 boreal chickadees in Dutchess County at the same time. Uh, yet the last sighting was 1982, well over 25 years ago. So, uh, that one's been demoted to casual. Now the transition is what we're talking about here. And 
my, the end is near now. Uh, I'm taking those 36 birds. If you recall one of the tables I showed at the beginning, um, Griscom listed 209 birds as regularly occurring in Dutchess County, 36 as casual accidental uh, in 1933. So of those 36 birds, 19 of them, we now consider regular. Um, the first four and maybe even uh, the next couple, the two wobblers after that, uh, there weren't, Crosby and, and Griscom did not have enough historical data to say they were regular in Dutchess County. Um, not enough people were looking, but uh, they were regular in the area in, the, uh, in New York State. And so uh, while I can't put a date to it, uh, those birds did become regular uh, before 1933. But as you go down that list, uh, Northern Cardinal shows up 1949, Carolina Wren, you can read through there. Um, but 17 of the birds that were reported in 1933 as casual or accidental uh, are still casual or accidental with the uh, passenger pigeon and shrike at the bottom. Uh, that were historical, I put on them. Uh, that's a tangent that I go off on. If anything has not been seen since 1950, and I think I need to bring that up to date a little more, but if the, la if the last sighting was um, older than 1950, I call that historical and kind of take it off some of our lists and, 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 and stick it to the side. And here are 20 more that Griscom, Crosby, 1933, these 20 birds were totally unknown in Dutchess County. The first sighting had not yet occurred. And you can go through that. Notice over on the right column, the lesser black back gull is near the bottom. 2016, that was considered regular. Uh, when I lived in Dutchess County, we did not see lesser black back gulls. And indeed, not too long before Barbara Butler and I joined the bird club, greater black back gulls were not seen in Dutchess County. Um, but yet, uh, I don't know if it's still there, but within the last few days, that's been reported at the uh, Beacon train station. So, and then there's the blue gross beak coming in again. So quite a list that uh, black vultures, we never saw black vultures in Dutchess County. Um, yet now they're certainly there. So to, uh, to end and summarize here, uh, the definition to determine whether a bird should be in Dutchess County or not really has to do with its range and how far out of range it is. Um, and these are sources of our next regular species. You wanna know which species is going to show up in the next 10 years and be regular, take a look at what's casual now. Um, and of course, some of these are, are new and some of them are just being repeated uh, and migration. That's the time they're going to show up. So uh, really, we are still somewhat in migration here until, until January. I think uh, we can have some, some odd things show up. And maybe even in January, if they're going to winter over. Summer tanager, I don't think we've seen until January last year. Um, but then, as I've said a couple of times, some of these will just revert back from regular and get demoted back to casual. So um, again, I want to thank everybody for keeping great records for reporting what you see, for taking pictures. Um, we have a lot of, uh, of good things there. So I will uh, end this and, and take questions. And I will, uh, if I will get out a screen sharing here and we can see people again. Well, I like to back one. Now I'm not... Uh, I'm not sure why I'm not going back to the full, oh, I know why, it's right here. Okay, um, I'm not quite sure why that didn't go bigger again. My screen, how do I stop screen sharing? Well, anyway, 
you can hear me. I can't hear you at the moment, but if you have any questions, uh, ask away and that's my story. <laughs> that's excellent. Very good. Anybody have any questions for Stan? Well, I either put everybody to sleep or I told them everything <laughs> no. they wanted to know, I guess. No, I, I want to thank Stan for, for allowing the recording of this because I'm going to have to listen to it again to like get it all. It was great information. I love it. 253 regulars. That's a tough number to reach. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I thank you. Um, Thank you for coming tonight, if you will. I, I like these Zoom things. It, it works well from, uh, from yeah. far away. You're just like those accidentals, I'm far away. Not expected again in Dutchess County year next all hands <laughs> meeting. Stan, I have a question. Yes. Um, so I, if I understood you correctly, you said that the number of casual accidental species have actually increased. Oh, considerably. Right. Do you think that's really just because there's more effort, more birders, more photographers out there, or whether it's some some different thing going on? Well, uh, I definitely agree there are more photographers, and therefore we're able to prove what we see. Right. Um, I'll use as a counterexample, and this may not be a good example, but a couple of days ago, a fellow reported a purple sandpiper up in Red Hook, uh, <laughs> or Tivoli, I guess it actually was. Um, I don't know, did he have a, he did not take a picture of it. He saw it for a couple of minutes and it disappeared. So yeah. those things happen. And we have had, if I, if I were to list all the birds that have been reported one time by one person without photographs and not refound again, there's an incredible list of very <laughs> odd things. Okay. Maybe that's an odd one and maybe it isn't. Maybe that's tomorrow's special bird, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But, um, this does seem to be with this global warming. I mean, birds are um, expanding their range. And when they expand their range, they start out as accidental or casual in the area they expand to. So I think the answer is both. Right, except we're also, as you pointed out, losing birds to the north too. That's true. That's not, true. Gain, not just gaining them from the south, right? But we're gaining more than we're losing. I guess that's the good news. <laughs> We'll take them all. <laughs> Where did the cardinal originate? Um, if you go back into the uh, 1800s, the cardinal was pretty much Pennsylvania and further south. And they seemed pretty stagnant. But they were seen in New York City at the turn of the 1900s, um, but not really living there. And then... Um, what was our, I showed the date there, 1948 or something like that. Um, they expanded into New Jersey. New Jersey is a great place to expand to. Uh, the, the, Southern New Jersey is so different from Northern New Jersey. There are a lot of birds that move into Southern New, New Jersey with Delaware Bay um, and from Pennsylvania and I guess Maryland uh, and Delaware. Um, and then once they get to New Jersey, they start working their way north through northern New Jersey, Long Island, Westchester, Orange County. Uh, it does just... uh, Stan, I have a question. This is Dave Grover. Um, how, how has the uh, changes of forests and also people feeding birds, has that influenced a lot about the birds that are now coming into our area and staying? Um, the big difference with, uh, the answer is probably yes, but the big difference with feeders is wintering. Yes. Um, there are tremendous number of birds that now stay over the winter that did not in years past. Uh, the example I use in Maine when that kind of a question comes up is the uh, uh, morning dove. The morning dove at one time was called the Carolina dove. <laughs> and it was a mid-Atlantic bird. It just did not exist much north of New York or, or let's say uh, Long Island. And when it did come into New England, 
uh, in upstate New York. It was primarily a migrant that was there in the summer and left in the winter. And as you well know, uh, they're there year round in numbers. So uh, uh, that may not be because of feeders entirely, but uh, feeders have unquestionably uh, increased the wintering birds. What about introduced species? Ah, you missed my talk a month or a year ago, whenever that was. Um, no, I was actually there. You were there, that's good. Yeah. Um, the introduced species right now are parrots. And it's unclear to me whether these parrots are escaping, being released. Now in general, parrot is a pretty long lived bird and I can mm -hmm. see, and they squawk. I, I can see a person saying they'd love to have a pet parrot and quickly becoming um, not interested in it. And they let it out the window, oops, and there it's gone. Um, but be it New York City, uh, be it Miami, be it Los Angeles, be it the Southern Texas where I'm going this winter, the parrots are literally everywhere. A uh, year and a half ago, or two winters ago, we were in Fort Lauderdale for the winter. And Joan and I spent about a week just looking for parrots. And it's amazing how many we found. And of course that's eBird to, to let you find them. But the variety is extensive. Um, the ABA, I'm not quite sure where to find this. They published it, uh, they published it someplace, maybe in their newsletter, in their magazine, but it must be online. Uh, the ABA keeps a list of birds that they view as uh, acceptable for your records, that is, they're established. And the number of parrots that they have uh, in these big cities, again, is, is amazing. Um, thankfully, there are not many introduced birds right now that are not parrots. Oh, Joan's got the list right here. Oh, I'll say I printed it off and she grabbed it. Uh, let me find the parrots. I think some pigeons as well, right? Yeah, yeah. And a purple swamp hen, I see that here. Oh, gee, the purple oh, yeah. swamp hen. They're taking over the Everglades. They have <laughs> taken over the Everglades. Bonk parakeet, Nande parakeet, green parakeet, white winged, yellow chevron, red crowned parrot, rose ringed parakeet. Um, Rosy faced lovebird, I guess that's not a parrot, but no, those are parrot. all acceptable birds now in various places uh, by the ABA. So yeah, there are more established birds around. I have a question. Yes. Hi Stan, Natalie Hi. Gilbert. Um, I scanned my parents' cards from years ago to you a few years ago. Yes, yes you did, and thank you very much. Um, my dad, who was a charter member, he always spoke about the introduction of the multiflora rose as a living fence on farm for pastures as a good reason that the cardinals came up this way because they ate the rose hips. That's interesting. That, may, that makes sense. Um, I don't know. And this but... is stuff I heard, you know, in the 70s as a, as a child. Yeah, um, as I say, it makes sense, although I'm personally not familiar with it to, to agree, but it sounds good. Any other questions? No, well, just look, in I, case people weren't looking at the chat though, Barbara Butler said that she has copies of the reference guide in the club history book. So contact her for a copy. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, Stan, we thank you for uh, presenting your program from Maine. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, and wish you a good trip. <laughs> <laughs>